Hello all and welcome to the 2023 Southeast Collaborative Online Conference. My name is Dorcas Davis and I'll be your host for this session, the Programming Framework. This event is supported through funding from the Library Services and Technology Act through the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Please feel free to ask questions or make comments in the chat and interact with other attendees and the speaker within the Whova app for this presentation. And now I'd like to introduce Ashley Pearson. Thanks for being with us. Hi, everyone. I am Ashley Pearson, and I am the member services librarian at Azalea Regional Library System. Thank you so much for joining me for this presentation on the programming framework, developing programming standards and benchmarks for success in public libraries. I hope everyone can see the slides. Before we begin, I just wanted to introduce myself. I, once again, am Ashley Pearson, the Member Services Librarian for Azalea Regional Library System in Madison, Georgia. I have been working with uh, libraries, especially public libraries, um, actually solely public libraries, for just over 12 years. Um, this is my fifth year of librarianship. Um, I graduated with my MLS from Valdosta State University in 2018, go Blazers. Um, I also worked in public libraries in Georgia and in Virginia. Um, so I've been able to see a multitude of different types of libraries. And that has been one of the more positive things <laughs> that I've been able to experience um, especially when it comes to developing programming and developing programming frameworks. Um, library programming, let's go to that, is my passion. It is the thing that keeps me motivated. I absolutely love programming in libraries, um, especially public libraries. Um, I love sharing my passion with people. I love consulting with libraries or with um, other uh, cohorts in the field of librarianship about programming um, and about the things that make programs attractive, accessible um, and also useful to the uh, patrons that are attending. Well, patrons or library users, whichever term you use. Um, I am the mama of two little cat jerks. <laughs> Their names are Juneteenth and Hedwig. And I hope through this presentation that you will not be able to hear them as they howl very loudly in the back way. In the back, I'm sorry, in the back. Um, I am a true blurred. I am a African-American nerd. Um, I love all things nerdy. And I have an obsession with horror movies and completely opposite of that, Harry Potter. So I am a Ravenclaw. So I hope there are other um, Harry Potter fans in the room. If so, I hope you know that you'll shout out your Harry Potter house. And maybe we can talk about it later during the conference as I'll be making my way about. All right, let's move on to the programming framework. Right now, we're going to talk about the importance of programming. A lot of library systems um, are moving towards more programming, which to me is a very positive thing because Programming is one of the things that keeps our libraries alive. They keep our libraries functioning. I know everyone has heard the question, oh, libraries still exist? Of course we do. We are full of information, but at the same time, we are now the new community place. We're the place where communities go to receive information, to enjoy programming that is both family oriented or individually oriented. And um, that makes libraries one of the major pillars of, um, I'm sorry, that makes programming one of the major pillars of libraries. Um, so to me, the library, the pillars of public library services um, are literacy, of course. Um, that's the foundation on which we stand, literacy and the access of information, 
programming. And of course, that's in bold because that's one of the things that is so important to me when it comes to programming, um, when it comes to libraries. Um, outreach, of course, going beyond the walls of the library to bring people into the library, especially during um, times where people think that libraries are not necessarily um, with the times, but we so are, um, and we still are. We are still important. We're still necessary. Um, the next is partnerships and community collaborations. Those are important because they are also one of the livelihoods of libraries. It is important to be integral in your community um, so that you can support the partner, support the organizations with partnerships that are actually in your community area or in your service area um, and providing resources and services. So out of all of that, Programming is the one that I will talk about today. Neither is more important or less important than the other. But like I said before, programming is just what I do. So I want to talk to you all today about how library programming is necessary. It's a structural pillar of an effective and engaging library. Um, but I know that there are people or library systems that are still kind of questioning the effectiveness or program of programming or the, necess the necessity of programming. So let's talk about that right now. Um, I pulled this from a library quote, I mean, an ALA pro public programming office library quote. Um, and I wanted to share it right now because I think it says basically what I'm trying to say um, about the importance of libraries. Library programming, helps to illuminate the experiences, the beliefs, and the values that unite us as human beings. They stimulate us to make connections where we notice none before between our ancestors and ourselves, between culture and another, between the community and the individual. So library programming is what connects us to our community, to our world around us, to the past, the present, and the future, and to ourselves as individuals. And it's so interesting that programs have the ability to do all of that. And that is the reason why I think that libraries are, that programming is so important to libraries. So let's also talk about the benefits of programming when it comes to libraries. So there is something that is a positive for us, and there's something that is a positive for the community around us or the service area um, where our libraries are and the service areas that they reach out to. So one benefit of programming for libraries is that they increase library patronage and engagement. One amazing thing is that you can use your library programming to do library cards, to give out library cards. I mean, we have an example of that in September. It is library card sign up month. So it's the time when we focus in on getting the public library cards. And there's so much programming that goes along with that. Um, so when people are pulled in by that programming, then you can in turn say, hey, since you've shown up for our programming, why don't you come and get a library card? No, it doesn't mean that you won't be able to attend our programs because you don't have a library card, but it helps them to engage more with the other pillars of libraries. So they can check out resources, they can get on the computer, they can, use our launch pads, they can use our story time kits, they can do the things that go beyond programming to enrich their lives, but to also expose them to literacy, to our partnerships and collaborations, and also to resources and services. So programming is hand in hand with all of the other aspects of library services or public library services. through. Library programming, 
libraries also are able to become mirrors and mirrors and windows. And what I mean by that, and I, I heard that quote and it has just stuck with me. At first I heard the quote about libraries becoming mirrors where you can see yourself, you should walk into a library and see yourself reflected there. But I also found out about libraries being windows. You should also be able to see the world that surrounds you, the societies, the cultures, the religion, the beliefs, everything that is like looking out of a window and seeing the world, not just seeing yourself. So um, you should be able to look out look introspectively and you should be able to look outwardly um, when it comes to libraries. That also rolls over into programming. You should be able to see yourself in programming. There should be something that attracts you when you think of a library program. There should be something in that library offered within the programming that says, hey, you should involve yourself in this but also there should be something that provides a window to the world around you in your programming. And that's where programming that involves diversity and inclusion um, and equ equitability, um, equitable programming, making sure that things are here, not skewed. Um, that is where that all comes in. Uh, another thing that libraries uh, benefit from programming is a lifelong learning opportunity. There are moments where itty bitty children learn when they come to early literacy events like story time, but then there are also opportunities for adults and older adults from teen to adults to older adults to learn and to be able to receive education as a lifelong process. It doesn't stop when you're children. It goes all the way through, which is one of the things that makes um, that makes programming for all ages in libraries so much more attractive because it just doesn't cut off at one age group. It goes until, you know, our senior adults, our older adults. Um, so, you know, with our technology programs or knitting groups, or I love retro programs where people can see the reflection of a time past that, you know, we can share with them again. Um, those are important. It's important to capture every age group. So um, that lifelong learning opportunity is something that we can give our public. We also offer support through programming for uh, and resources for individuals with disabilities. Um, that's our sensory story time. Also, um, you know, we, off, we offer uh, talking books from GLS. Um, those are our recorded books where they can hear recorded stories. And that is, you can have a book club or like I said, a sensory story time, or maybe those with mental health challenges, we can offer a mental health forum. Um, in the past, I've offered a teen forum called We've Got Issues, where teens can get together in a room and just talk about the things that are important to them, both inwardly and outwardly. And um, we can offer self-care seminars. Um, and then also there are those in our communities who need socializing opportunities. They need time or opportunities to go out and to talk or to sit with people and to just spend time with people. Um, you know, those who need social interaction who don't necessarily get that social interaction they need every day. So these are the things that benefit libraries, but also the communities around us. These are the things that we offer that not only that we can offer, but that we can give to our community. Um, so next, the benefits of programming to our communities, and I kind of touched on that before um, with the uh, actual benefits that the library provides, but now here are the benefits that we 
actually do provide to our communities. Um, we offer community resources. Um, libraries now serve as a cultural and, a, and civic life. So there's definitely been a lack of community centers. Um, when I was growing up, there were community centers where you would go and you could go to the YMCA, you could go to a community center that's in your neighborhood, you could go to the Boys and Girls Club, and those were extremely popular when I was growing up. I have probably aged myself, but, but it's, there's been a change in the way that society moves. Our culture is not so much, hey, let's go to a Boys and Girls Club, let's go here, let's go there. It's, those aren't, they aren't often um, they aren't often in our communities anymore. So now it's the library's um, job to provide the community resources that these community centers or these cultural centers used to provide um, or previously provided. I know that in one of the uh, neighborhoods where I grew up, there is no community center anymore. You see them very rarely. So, and I know that's a touchy place for libraries sometimes, especially public libraries, in knowing that this is now something that we are tasked to provide to community, but just like um, information. Um, and one thing I learned when I was in my MLIS program is information is always changing. So libraries are always changing because we are a reflection of information. We are a repository for information. So just as we are a repository for information, we are a repository for civic life and resources and things that do promote um, wellness in the community and in you know, the community being informed. So that is who we are now. We've changed not only with information, the way we get information, the way we give information, we've also changed with the way that we are seen in society. And um, now this is one of those ways. Um, we also uh, have lack of organizational like places that usually would have been found in a community, but it, it is surprising that they're not anymore. Like, for instance, there is a lack of the Department of Labor in the six counties that my library system covers. We don't have a Department of Labor. So you can just imagine the challenges that our library systems, libraries are facing when it comes to um, those individuals in the communities that are looking for jobs, they're looking for resources, they're looking, they're looking for how to write a resume, they're looking for tests that they need to take to allow them to get positions in the, um, in the career that they'd like to work in or that they'd like to move into. So that lack of a Department of Labor now tasks our systems libraries into being more than just a community center, but also now a department of labor, which means that we have to provide the resources that the community needs because there is no DOL. Um, so I, I mentioned that because I want you to see just how important um, programming like um, job fairs, like, um, you know, opportunities for people to come and talk to different hiring agencies. Um, that is, that is why we are so important. We have to stand in and be that place now. Right. The next thing is, of course, that I spoke about earlier, we are repository for, I'm sorry, we offer free resources and materials. I'll move to the repository of information in a moment. But um, we serve communities with a lack of resources. And I touched on that just a minute ago with the lack of Department of Labor. Um, communities where there are seniors on fixed incomes. Uh, we provide courses where 
you know, they can learn how to budget, where they can find resources that they need um, to get the medicines that they need, or um, just maybe like a social thing. We provide social outings for seniors who are now retired. I mean, you know, that's a necessity um, because there is a lack of something that they need. Uh, Title I schools, some Title I schools, which I've worked in previously, um, they experience a lack of funding. And one thing that libraries are great about doing, even just with schools that are not Title I, is partnering with the school system in regards to programming so that they're able to maybe get a resource or um, get materials that they were not able to have access to previously. And of course, you know that I have worked in so many um, different library systems that um, range from, you know, schools having their own technology to schools not having any technology, let alone a library. Um, that is very important that you're able, that libraries are able to fit in there with their programming. Um, one of my most memorable opportunities of programming with Title I schools is bringing um, a lot of the STEM equipment that we had in that library, that library system to places um, that weren't able to just readily come to our library. I took all of that information to them. Um, 3D pens, we had programming, we had steamy science day. Um, and that was something that enhanced those children's experience with science, with technology, with engineering, arts, and math. Um, also the economically stressed and challenged. Um, they're able to um, receive resources figure out ways to connect with the uh, community partners that we may have as libraries through programming. Um, just having a community partner sit in a library for a day and answer questions, that helps people that are stressed economically or they're challenged economically. Um, those experiencing homelessness, the free resources that we have in libraries and the free programming that they can come and join in on. Perhaps, you know, if we have a programming, a program where there is, you know, a meal offered, that may be the only meal they're getting that day. Um, also, rural areas, and um, I don't know if I said before, but my library system is rural. It's a combination of rural and urban. And I know that is so interesting, but it is a combination of rural and urban libraries. So um, there, some of our libraries are limited with their access to broadband. They don't have really good Wi-Fi. That's why we allow people to come in and use our internet. Or we have programs where we teach people to use the internet. Um, also transportation, the outreach programs that we perform in our library's uh, service area, those help people who are not able to come to the library. Everyone is not able to, especially in a rural library system, is not able to drive uh, maybe at some times 15 miles out to the closest library because there's only one library in their county. So um, also resources are great for new arrivals to the community, to the state or to the country. Um, when we have ELL courses, it's wonderful for people who are trying to learn English so that they can, you know, exist here in this new country or survive here or thrive here in this new country where English is the main language. Um, those ELL classes or ELL opportunities give them the chance to practice learning English, to learn conversational English, and they can do that for free. And the programs are accessible to everyone. Also, the repository for information is another thing that we, like I spoke about earlier, that we offer. 
Um, we have public computer access, printing stations, maker spaces, tech labs. Those things are for free and they're accessible to anyone who enters our library. Also, and finally, it encourages civic engagement. And this is one of the things that is extremely important to me considering that civic engagement is one of the things that, um, especially after COVID has been very, very hard engaging with people. Thinking about our um, summer reading program theme this year, um, you know, and I know it's different from place to place, but in Georgia, the theme is all together now. And being able to bring people back together and remind them of the importance of civic engagement and engaging with their community, engaging with the area around them. That is one of the important things because it focuses the community and its population. Even though we want to focus outward into the larger world, it helps them focus inward. What does my community offer? But what does my community need? So it also, it brings a community together especially with some of the programs that I know we are planning for summer reading, there are going to be a lot of programs where the community will be offered a chance to come and be all together again, um, like community block parties or a community movie event. So being able to see all of these places where programming really touches and reaches out its roots to the community and engages the community and enhances the community is why programming is so vital and so important to libraries and to our survival and our um, continuing to be necessary and um, important in these communities. Right. I have a quote that was, it, it seems like it's a little weird, but we're going to talk about it for a second, about library programs and civic engagement. Not only do we reach out, we also bring in. So bringing real artists, real authors, real people into the library is a benefit of public programming and for participating libraries and audiences. These are the connections that we can make through our programming. Our artists, and, and this is really important to me because my library just got the um, Vibrant Community Grant. We were awarded that um, back in October, September, and um, from the Georgia Council of the Arts. And one of the things that that grant enhances is being able to give our community's artists a platform so that the community can engage with those artists. And that has just been so wonderful. Not only have we been able to um, promote art within the community, but we've been able to bring artists to one focal place so that all of the community can come in and see those artists that they may not have seen before. Because, you know, unless this person has a store or a studio, they might not get any exposure. So libraries have the ability to give the public exposure to the arts, to the exceptional people, to the stories in their community. Now, I'm a realist, so I want to talk about the programming challenges that libraries and library systems may be facing. Because to be very honest, you know, it's cool to think about the fact that programs do all of these awesome things, but then we have to really understand, you know, in a library that is trying to uh, provide programming or maybe start programming and they've never done it before, or they find, they're finding that their programs are not effective, what are the programming challenges that you're facing? So are there challenges that you find yourself or your library, your branch, or your system facing? Um, if there are, feel free to place them in the chat on Whova, and we can discuss them later um, when this recording is over. Um, possible issues that I've come up with from talking to people in the field are no, no roadmap. Where do I go? How do I know what the next move is when it comes to programming? 
How do I know how to start programming? Um, maybe no instruction. How do I? How do I do any of this that I am supposed to do? You know, especially if you find that you're you've never done programming before. Um, no support. I can't do this because I don't know how to work around our budget. I don't, we have a budget, but I don't know how to use it. I don't know how to get the accessible to get access to those in the community that can help me with this program or I just don't know what I'm doing and I need someone to support me <laughs> or no expectations. What do I do? Like what, what now that I've done programming, what, do, where do I go from here? What do I do? What is the expectation of this programming? What should I expect when I'm doing programming? So very quickly, I want to have a little bit of a story time moment. And it's going to be a very quick story time moment, but it will be one. Um, my journey with programming, am I doing this right? <laughs> so I want to, you know, kind of talk about how um, I learned the ropes of programming. When I entered programming, I did not enter it all knowing. I actually entered as a paraprofessional. I was a docent and then I started programming for youth and a docent is a greeter. And then I started programming for youth. The only thing I had as a foundation was the fact that I had in the past worked with younger children. So it wasn't so intimidating to work with younger children, but I had worked in an educational environment and that is completely different. Um, from the things that we're able to do within programming in a public library or in libraries in general. Um, so I had to get to a place where I felt comfortable with what I was expected to do in this new expectation. So programming is not super simple. You, there are things that you move into and there are things that you have to understand like budgeting for your programming, volunteers, background checks for those volunteers, um, being able to purchase materials on that budget, um, being able to set up inside of a room, uh, things that you can't do, things that you can do. There were a lot of, you know, background things that I did not understand from a library POV instead of a, or perspective instead of a educational an educational perspective. So I had to learn the ropes of programming. And I will say that it was an adventure. It was definitely a venture. There were a lot of things that I did wrong. I will admit that, but there were a lot of things that moved me forward into doing the right thing. So then I went to pushing the limits. <laughs> um, when I finally felt comfortable with developing my own programming, I started to think about well, what can I offer? I don't have the, the same uh, curriculum uh, limitations that I would in a school system um, with what I can offer and what I can't because I have to teach according to the curriculum. So I wanna do this program and I wanna do that program. And it was really fun for my supervisor at the time because <laughs> all of my programs, I mean, they were a little out there. But when I got that little spark, I knew when I started to research and look at other programming um, offerings, other programs in other library uh, systems. And when I went to conferences and learned about the things that we could do, I started wanting to push the limits of programming by going farther into what we can do. Um, and I mean, just an example, uh, I think I went a little far because um, I started, you know, thinking about having Beyonce tickets for a prize, Beyonce concert tickets as a prize for, um, you know, summer reading program. But surprise, surprise, I did it. <laughs> Was it hard? Yes, but I did it. And um, that helped me understand that there was creativity and innovation in programming. And then joining another library system, I began to program on the go. This library system was in the midst of a massive renovation project. So I didn't 
have anything to stand on when it came to programming. I didn't have anywhere to go. I didn't know what to do because this was a new situation. Of course, I had been very, very into being creative, but I didn't know how to build from the bottom up and then move with it. And um, because my library was being renovated. So in order to provide um, consistent programming, I had to make programming on the go. And um, that turned into me doing outreach a lot. So that really put me in my programming bag because I had to reach deep down and really figure out, okay, what does this community need from me? Because I can't just offer things. Everything has to be purposeful because I've got to carry everything with me. Everything has to be um, really well thought out and really well focused on so that I know how to make this programming effective in the short amount of time that I have with this group. So that made me um, form a program called um, Steamy, Steamy, um, Steamy Storytime. And that Steamy Storytime was actually for ages K through sixth grade. Um, and I changed, I had to learn how to change and manipulate that programming based on these children's literacy levels and where they should be, where they were. Um, and also I had to add in STEAM concepts. So that, that was really stretching me. It really stretched me, but it stretched me in a good way because I learned how to number one, outreach, do programming, number two, do programming within outreaching. And then number three, I learned how to cultivate programming for a community. Not necessarily what I wanted to do, but what I knew this community needed. And then finally, and here's the kicker, and I know everyone had this experience, <laughs> programming in quarantine. Programming in quarantine was definitely a, it, I think it was harder than programming on the go because instead of programming in person, which I was completely used to, and even programming out in the community, which I was used to now, I had to learn how to program between, with a screen between me and the person that I, and the uh, group that I was offering the programming to. So it made me dig deeper in my programming bag <laughs> in order to figure out how to effectively give during this time in our nation's, in our world's history, which, you know, it wasn't necessarily only, oh no, everyone's stuck in the house. It was, People are sick. We're trying to figure out what's going on. Um, there was the racial tension of the death of um, George Floyd um, and, and the other countless individuals that, you know, experienced the loss of life during this time. It's, there was a lot going on. So all of my programming had to reflect what was going to help people survive during this time and hopefully thrive. So I developed a gaming night that was virtual. We played Among Us together. I also um, developed a line, not a line, but a series of um, racial conversations where people came together and talked about what was happening in our nation um, concerning um, you know, Black Lives Mattering. Um, and that was a hit because we had an EDI specialist virtually come in and have conversations with us as well. So it's almost like I had to learn through all of this, in all of this journey, how to move with, um, what was happening in our world, what was happening in our lives, what was happening in my life or the life of my system. Um, and it was becoming a programming chameleon. <laughs> but one thing that I know would have really, really helped during all of this change and shifting and being a chameleon was um, having a framework to follow. And a framework that made me understand 
what my purpose was in programming, what I'm trying to accomplish, how I'm going to go about doing that, something to build off of. So now I'm going to talk to you about the title of this, com of this uh, presentation, the programming framework. So I know that there is a question about what this is. The programming framework is a set of expectations from the system, from our library system, um, from administration, from even if a library decides to take on a programming framework of their own um, or a branch does, a library or a branch, um, it's a set of expectations about what programming should look like. It's a scaffolding for evaluating a system's programming as well. It gives you set things to evaluate your programs on. So you're not necessarily just kind of free, free flying out in the open, trying to figure out what works and what doesn't. You have an evaluation process to go along with that helps you figure out what works and what doesn't. Also, um, the programming framework is a way for libraries to set goals for the future success or for the direction, and, well, or slash and for the direction of their programming in the future. Um, your benchmarks are developed through your programming framework. Although it's important to have benchmarks initially so that people know what their expectation is. And when I say benchmarks, I mean places that you're gonna need to hit so that you know that your programming is effective. Um, but if it takes, there is no specific order that needs to be accomplished when you're trying to figure out how to build your programming framework. What problems does the programming framework solve? The programming framework solves scattered programming, programming that's all over the place that doesn't necessarily answer the needs of the community. It gives you a streamlined way to figure out, hey, what do I need to do in lieu of my community? What do they need? What, what, does, what does this singular community need that another library in my system might not need, another library in my system's community might not need? So it really personalizes the programming that you offer in your libraries. Um, it also gets rid of that lack of programming direction. Um, I don't know if anybody else has experienced that, but sometimes I get stuck at a place like, okay, I'm planning this programming. Nobody is attending this programming. So, but they did in the beginning. So why aren't they attending now? Maybe that means that there is something else that you need to add, take away, um, change in your programming lineup. Line so, excuse me, I'm so sorry. So um, um, that gets rid of that lack of programming direction where you don't know where, you know, you're, you're veering off into a couple of branches that you could go into or a couple of paths that you could go where you could journey further into, but it gives you a more directed path. Um, also, it gets rid of insufficient methods of tracking programming goals, okay? So you'll have a method to track your programming goal now. It's not just sitting and wondering, okay, how do I know if this program is effective? How do I know if my library is hitting the programming, you know, goals that we've set for ourselves? How, should we be setting programming goals? The library, I mean, I'm sorry, the programming framework clears all of that um, unsurety out of the way. Um, not that it will immediately do that. I want to also put that in there, but it helps you get to a direction where you're making your way to clearing that insurety out of the way, unsurety out of the way. So let's talk about developing the framework. We're going to think about um, evaluation of benchmarks. Oh, hold on, I think I went too far. Yeah, there we go, I did. Okay, one second. Uh-oh. 
There we go. Yes, I was on the right one. All right. So developing the programming framework. How did it come back? Well, my library system was new to programming. And the one that I just entered, new to programming. The director introduced a programming push to libraries. And unfortunately, because the libraries were not expected to do a lot of programming outside of paid programming, um, they were, there was a differing of, there was a lot of uh, levels of programming knowledge, like from very little programming knowledge to a lot of programming knowledge from I really don't know what I'm doing here. Someone please help me. How do I know that this programming is effective? How do I know that I'm doing what I need to do when it comes to programs? And then also it went net, you know, it went to, oh, I've been doing, you know, I worked in a program, I worked in a library that offered programming before. I'm fine. I know what to do. But what do I do in this library system? I know what I did in other library systems, but what do I do in this one? So the point of this framework was to streamline programming across the system. So essentially we started with the same expectations, the same evaluation criteria. So when it comes to developing the, um, When it comes to developing the programming framework, you're building benchmarks, okay? So what we're, what you find an issue in doing sometimes is figuring out how to start building those benchmarks. Um, one thing that we were doing, let me back up a second because I think, Okay, one thing that we were doing, my slides are a little out of place, but that's okay, we'll keep on rolling. One of the things that we did run into was, okay, how are we going to build benchmarks or how are we going to develop this programming framework considering that we are one system that has multiple service expectations. So I, I said once before, we had a library system, I mean, the library system that I'm in, is a system that has varying populations. So with varying populations from rural to urban, there are gonna be different expectations. Even some of the library, the libraries that are sort of like each other, um, they have a couple of things that are similar. Even in their populations, their communities might be different from each other um, or their community needs might be different from each other. Um, so there may be a community that is needing children's literacy, um, versus career training. So you kind of have to make sure that you know where you are <laughs> and what your, what your community needs, who your community is. So with different populations, We've got one library that has a very large ELL population. They are English language learners. But then we have another population, I mean, another library that has a population of senior, senior adults or seniors who are retirees. So their needs are gonna be a little different. Um, also, um, that's something to take into perspective when you are developing the programming framework. Um, so with that challenge comes this solution. How do we figure out what to do? How do we figure out, number one, what our community is, who's in it? Um, how do we figure out what they need? How do we figure out what their challenges are? Number one thing that we did was look at the census, review your census. Um, if it is more... Uh, if the census is more um, current, that does help. But sometimes um, there on the census website, 
there are smaller censuses that they've done where you can actually see like, even though the last census was 10 years ago, there's been a study done where the population has gone up by 0.5% in the last two years. So you need to know what your population looks like. Um, what is your library's classification? Are they rural? Are they suburban? Are they urban? What type of library community are you serving? Um, also, we decided to do a system-wide library programming and services survey. So we sent out a uh, um, online survey, um, but we also had surveys that were printed um, that were available at the front desk at every library. And every uh, library was responsible for having these, um, these uh, their community fill out these library surveys to kind of tell us what they were looking for when it came to programming. What were some of their community needs? And honestly, we found out a lot about our communities based on those people that were come in, coming in or that were taking the time to fill out the surveys. We figured out what we needed. We figured out what we didn't need and what they didn't like. So that helps to move forward with your programming framework because it helps you figure out, okay, what programs do they need more of? Do they need more of teen programming? Well, there aren't as many teens in this, in this community because there are only retirees. So, you know, it, it helps you figure out how you can be of, you know, the best service to your community. Also, interviewing your local partnerships, your organizations, taking time to talk to your Boys and Girls Club, taking time to talk to your local Kiwanis group, taking time to talk to your 4-H groups, talk to your schools, talk to your businesses that are in your towns, in your city towns. Um, get the Get the local consensus, even if it's just stopping in because this person, I'm sorry, because this organization or this business is a partnership that you've had for a while and just having a chat with them, a very, very general chat with them about how they see the library's programming, making a change, not making a change, influencing the community, okay? Um, reviewing interviewing library managers and staff, especially if you have library managers who have been there for a while, who have seen the community change, who have seen the community stay the same. Those are people that you really wanna to talk to because they've been programming, if they have been programming in that community for a while. If they haven't, but they've been there for a while, they may know a lot of people or they may have good connections in the community and they may know what people are actually wanting to see and to um, what they need in that particular community. Um, reviewing library programs at local libraries. So I'm one person who absolutely loves to go to other libraries to see how they are doing with their communities. And if their communities are a little bit like our community, maybe that's something that we need to adapt to. Maybe it isn't because it's not working successfully at their library. So um, try to find libraries that match the service area of your library system, of your library systems, branches, or libraries, okay? Using knowledge or ideas from colleagues. That's another really good one, you know, that don't necessarily work in your system, that work outside of your system. Um, just having sit downs with them. Find out, finding out what works, what doesn't work, and using past experience. Like I just talked about a second ago, I have had a lot of experience with programming and all of that experience has not been the same. So attaching some of that to your programming framework, what worked, what didn't work, sometimes that will assist as well. When you talk about evaluating your when you talk about developing the programming framework, you're also going to evaluate those benchmarks that you have developed, okay? So in evaluating those 
benchmarks that you've developed or evaluating that rubric that you've developed or the standards that you've developed. Do these benchmarks work for every programming experience level, service area, or library budget? That is an extremely important thing to ask and to consider. Let me move forward a little bit. When you're developing, when you're evaluating the benchmarks, ask yourself, is this attainable or achievable for every library? Is this realistic for every library? Is it relevant for every library? Is it under or overwhelming for every library? Or is it clear and concise for every library? And I do wanna specify you're talking about the libraries or the branches in your system. Can every library achieve this? Will every library be able to do this? So it's good to have a range. And if you don't have a specific range, make sure that you have a library and the things that they will need to hit based on the fact that they are suburban, if they're rural, or if they're urban. And um, I will, um, we're going to talk about that in a minute, formatting. So the next thing that I want to talk about is you won't know if any of these things, the attainability of your benchmarks or your standards, the realistic, like, do they make sense? Are they, are they realistic to the libraries? You won't know this unless you have a moment where you are having a manager review or you're having a library branch or library system review. Personally, we decided to have a manager review. We took managers that were very familiar with programming, that were more active with programming. And then we took maybe I think one manager that was not very active with programming. And we ran, we gave them our standards, our rubric, and we had them answer whether this is realistic, whether it's attainable. They went through all of that, all of this information to tell us whether this is something that they could do or something that they couldn't do. And that is important. You have to make sure that the people that are using this rubric, these standards, these benchmarks, you have to make sure that they're able to fulfill the level of expectation. Because if they can't, then why are these benchmarks here? Then I don't mean, oh, they can't because they just, you know, no, I mean, it's they can't because they're way too high, overwhelming, or way too low. They're underwhelming. So you want to give a little bit of challenge, but you don't want to over challenge where they can't reach the expectations that you're asking them to rise to. Also make sure that they are clear and concise. That is so important. And that's how we are going to move on to developing the formatting. Make sure that your framework and your rubric is comprehensive. Everything that needs to be in it is in it. Include a key of terms that are used in your rubric. Please have supplemental things like ideas and suggestions for programming um, so that they'll have something to stand on when you introduce the rubric. Make sure that it's organized. Um, everything can't necessarily be completely all over the place because then people are confused and they won't use it. Make sure that it's complete, that everything program related is included. That means summer reading programs. If you, if you um, consider your displays, your library displays as a program, if you consider your passive programming or, or your asynchronous programming, same thing as a program, then you need to have it and the standards and expectations in your framework. Make sure that it is narrowed to the library's programming specifications. So make sure that your libraries are able to see themselves in these standards because if, if they can't see themselves in the standards, then what's the point? Okay, now here I have examples of a couple of frameworks 
This one on the left is ours. Um, this is the one that we developed initially. And this is Hall County's library system program standards. They have a more virtual programming standard layout, which I absolutely love. Um, and it's something that we're thinking about moving to because it just, it makes everything more concise. The one on the left, which is ours, is a little bit more official. Um, and these will be in your handouts. So if you'd like to refer to them in your handouts, you also can do that. Um, because I know they're a little difficult to see on screen. But um, this is the program key that I talked about before. It talks about everything that, we, that we're expecting programming wise. It explains that programming. And then it also moves into um, talking about the, the abbreviations um, that we uh, practice as Georgia libraries, like YC means young child, you know, SA means school age. So those abbreviations need to also be in your key or your legend. Then, Right here we have the areas of actual expectations, what every library should be doing and how you know that you're achieving what you should be achieving, whether you are highly proficient, whether you are you know, uh, proficient or whether you're beginning or developing. So highly proficient programming for adult programming may be having one, program a month, I mean, one program weekly, a drop-in program where people just come and drop in and they leave when they're ready, one or two passive programs where it's ongoing all through the day from one date to another date, and one specially one special program monthly. So essentially that's a series, speaker, a class, um, but our, our managers and our teams know, okay, if we're hitting this, we're proficient. If we're hitting this, we're highly proficient. But if we're hitting this, you know, we're developing and we want to get to that helps to set goals. So as you can see, Hall Counties does about the same thing. They tell you the programming types, passive, special programs, youth educational and art events that are specific to their county. But they also show right here um, the basic programming, the emergent programming. They show per library what is, inspect what is expected. So this is one library's expectation best based on the size of their building and based on the size of their population. So formats are going to differ. And like I said, these are in your handout. So if you wanna see these a little bit more up close, you can definitely do that um, by flipping through those handouts. Oops, okay. <laughs> so another thing that I wanna talk about very quickly is introducing the programming framework. So I want, to, I, want, I want to talk about the good, the meh, and the not so pleasant. First scenario, and I do want to be realistic about it because I wasn't realistic when I was de developing these programming standards. I thought everybody was just going to jump on board and it'd be awesome, but that's not necessarily what always happens. So let's go through these scenarios very quickly. The good, the scenario is happy managers, Happy Library. The managers are so excited about this new framework. They can't wait to get started. The program, oh, everything looks like it's completely achievable. We can't wait to do it. Yeah, that doesn't happen all the time. <laughs> but when it does happen, helpful hints are continue to offer support because there, there might be a little bit of excitement, but some people might run into roadblocks. So please offer support. Don't think that just because there is excitement that it's going to be super easy and everybody's going to be fine with what they're doing and they're going to know what to do. That's not what happens all the time. Also, use a meeting, a staff meeting. Um, you know, if you have library staff meetings, use those meetings to introduce and explain the framework. The worst thing is just giving it to someone and expecting them to try to sort it out themselves. They need a walkthrough. So make sure to do that, no matter if they're excited or what. Make sure to do that. Don't be afraid also to show and tell. 
show and tell means, hey, you know, if you are saying that you want a workshop or a series speaker or a class, if it's something like that, that you want for your adult programming and you want them to do one monthly, put on one or make that program and actually go from library to library doing that program so they can see what that one special program looks like to be highly proficient. Um, don't be afraid to show. Um, a spinning top, when you set it spinning, it may continue to spin for a little while, but when it loses momentum, it stops. So you've got to make sure that you are consistently offering momentum so that they always know what it takes to continue spinning, okay? The meh. And I call this scenario too long, didn't read. TLDR. So you've presented this cool programming framework that you're super excited about. And this is what you get at the meeting. Okay. And that's what you get at the meeting. Basically, people aren't very excited about it. They're just kind of like, okay, I mean, there's like this paper in front of me with all of these expectations, but you know, I mean, I'm not really excited. I'm kind of neutral about it. It is what it is. So in order to get people to really support the programming framework, you're gonna have to include incentives and positive reinforcement. If you see that people are moving towards it and they're doing it and they're actually getting good results or whether they're getting negative results, give them positive reinforcement. Hey, I'm glad that you're doing it. What do you think there's something that we could change? You know, what's something that we could change? Um, about what's going on with this programming framework that you see that doesn't work. It won't work if it's not worked. If you don't use it, you'll never truly see the results of it, whether negative or positive. So you've got to keep the momentum going. If people are not buying into it, even if, you know, you're trying to see what's, you know, whether it's going to work or whether it's not going to work, you've got to keep on the incentives, meaning, hey, I saw that you did this this week. You're our programmer of the week in like a program in a weekly email that you sent out to the public. Sending a little email, hey, I see that you guys did this. That That is positive reinforcement, you know? Um, always return to the framework. If you see that people are not necessarily paying attention to the framework because it was too long, didn't read, um, a really good idea is to always go back to the framework. So I see that you did this amount of programming, uh, but you did about five teen programming um, programs this month, but you didn't do any adult programs. What happened? You know, what's going on? Is there something that, you know, we need to assist you with? Because, you know, what we're really trying to do is get those adult programs going. We're really trying to increase our adult programming as well as the teen programming. We're trying to do all around program, whatever your library is, is pushing. Make sure that you always return to the framework because the framework says that you're supposed to have three adult programs this month if you want to be beginner or developing. Always return to the framework. Um, promote it, promote it, promote it. Stop in. See what people need help with. See if they don't understand something. Have weekly check-ins with your, or monthly check-ins or bi-weekly check-ins with your team, with your managerial team, with your staff, with their staffs. You know, make sure that they are um, talking and conversing about what they don't like, what they do like. Always get the input from the people that are implementing the framework and working with it every day, okay? Put your framework to the test and don't be upset or discouraged if after a trial run, it doesn't meet your expectations. Frameworks are to build upon, okay? So this last scenario is the not so pleasant. The not so pleasant, great. Another thing on my plate, when you <laughs> present this programming framework to the people that will be using it, 
Um, great, another thing on my plate, I'm so excited. Well, like I said, with the meh category, the not so pleasant also needs buy-in. They also need the buy-in that says this is a really good thing if you work it out, if you, uh, if you work through it, you know, if you stick with it. So always demonstrate your programs to get buy-in. It's almost the same thing as the meh category, okay? Continue to follow through with programming. Continue to follow through, encourage follow through. Sometimes it feels like you'll be pushing or pulling, you know, to see if this really does work. Um, but continue to make sure that you do the work that you put the effort in to make sure that people are processing it enough that at the end of your evaluation period, you can see if this really worked or if it's really, if we need a framework or if we need a different type of framework, because you're going based on if it works or not, not, oh, this just is something we're going to do, but does it work? How could it work? Does it not work? You know, um, like I said, you're putting it to the test. So don't be upset during a trial run if it doesn't meet the expectations of you or your system. Also, listen for and take constructive criticism when it comes to this category. Sensitivity about the framework is possible, especially when you enter a library system where people have not been programming. This is how we've always done it. It happens, but well, I'm sorry, if you're introducing it to a library system that really doesn't program, has a set way of programming. Um, but don't get, you don't get sensitive about the framework, especially if you put a lot of work into it. But it's okay to receive tips and feedback from your teams that or your staff that will make your framework even better to those who are using it every day. And you notice I said constructive criticism. We're not talking about the criticism is I just don't want to do it because I don't like it. That's when you kind of have to urge a little, put more emphasis on the buy-in, put more emphasis on giving incentives or positive reinforcement um, because you're implementing this for a reason because there is a lack in programming or we're trying to go another direction in our programming. So you have to stay true to the cause of why you're using the framework. Okay. So finally, keep calm and program on. <laughs> no matter what, this framework is built to assist you in learning how to develop programming. It's not built to be a hindrance, it's built to be a plus. So I have a couple of tips to um, make sure that you are moving forward. Know and understand the purpose of your programming. Always review the data. So anytime during this situation, you should be reviewing the data. Think, plan, and execute realistically. If at first your framework doesn't succeed, don't be afraid to ask why it didn't succeed. That's where the feedback and the constructive criticism come in. Don't rush the project. Um, don't rush the process. Take the time to go through everything that you need to go through in order to get the benchmarks or the framework I'm sorry, the framework where it needs to be. Don't skimp on the research. Please do not skimp on the research. That could be your downfall. Make sure that you are researching enough to have a collective way to build those value, to build those uh, benchmarks or those standards when you need to. Trying something doesn't mean that you do away completely with the old. So take a couple of the old things that worked in the past. Add those to the bench, add those to the framework. Make sure they're in the framework. You don't have to completely scratch something just because you're developing something new. 
and plan along. And I think this is one of the most important ones. If your library has a strategic plan, plan programming alongside that strategic plan. What, what part of your strategic plan did the programming come in on? What did it say? And then take what that part of your programming strategic plan said about your programming and move that into your framework. Trying to, there we go. Thank you so much for listening, going through my technical difficulties um, and sitting through my presentation for the programming framework. If you have any questions, please prepare them now. And um, there is my contact information. Um, it will stay on the screen while you're asking questions. And um, once again, thanks so much. Thank you, Ashley, for being with us today. And thank you everyone for attending um, our webinar. If you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to the speaker or to the conference host using the Hula app. An evaluation is provided with the conference session resources and we welcome your feedback about the session and the conference. So thanks everyone for making the 2023 Southeast Collaborative Conference successful. See you all next year.